Have you ever wondered what your future is going to look like? I'm talking about what's your future going to look like when Jesus comes. Sometimes our situation, our circumstances, kind of like the circumstances where we're in today with this virus going on, dominating the headlines, dominating our thoughts, uh, dominating our actions. And sometimes things like that can cloud us or prevent us from thinking about our future. But what God wants to know is, or wants to tell us is that no matter what we're going through or no matter what we're facing, he has a glorious future for those who remain faithful, those who are obedient. He has a great and glorious future for us. In our lesson today, we're going to find a people that have been rebellious, a people who have grown weary, a people who are losing faith in God's promises, and he's going to tell them that I have a glorious future for you. Things are going to look good. I am going to take care of you. I'm going to keep every promise that I made. And that's what we need to remember, that God is going to keep every promise that he's made. And no matter what you and I are going through, like what we're going through today, whether we lost our job, whether we're having financial problems, whether we're ill, whether we lost a loved one, guess what? God's going to keep his promises and we have a great future. Thank you for joining me for today's lesson. Hello everyone, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, April 26, 2020. The title of the lesson is A Justice Loving God. It will come from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 8 through 11, and then we'll continue through chapter 20, 62, verses 2 through 4 a justice loving God. Before we get into our lesson, I want to remind you, if you find that this lesson is helpful, beneficial to you or to maybe a friend or relative, please uh, hit the like button, hit the share button, share the lesson with them. And if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it. I want to get this lesson out to as many people as possible. Thank you so much. So let's get into our lesson. As we come to our lesson, uh, Isaiah is written by Isaiah himself, a prophet. Uh, he began, his calling began in 740 uh, BC. He's the son of Amos. Uh, he is prophesizing through difficult times. And the book of Isaiah has three different time frames. And we need to know that so we can know what time frame we are in in our lesson. Uh, chapters 1 through 39 is Isaiah is prophesizing to his contemporaries. Uh, it's around uh, 740 BC, as I mentioned. Uh, there is a Syrian threat to the Northern Kingdom and to the Southern Kingdom, Judah. Uh, he is prophesizing judgment on them because of their rebellious ways. As we'll find out that the, the Northern Kingdom will be destroyed by Assyria. Syria will then come and try to lay siege on Judah themselves. They will not prevail. God will spare them. They will knock off every city except for the capital city of Jerusalem. And so what Isaiah is prophesying through that time through a rebellious and wicked people, idolatry, uh, oppressing the poor, all kind of sin is going there. He is telling them that judgment is coming. And then as we move from chapter 40 to chapter 55, during that time frame, Isaiah is prophesizing well into the future. His audience is no longer his contemporaries, but his message is geared toward those who are will be in Babylonian exile, those who are going through difficult times, those who are wondering, is there any type of hope? And so he's, he's going to be prophesizing to his contemporaries, 1 through 39, then 40 through 55, He's going to be prophesizing well into the future. And then in our today's lesson, beginning with chapter 56 through 66, he is prophesizing to those who have come out of exile, 
those remnant that God spared, those uh, who God is calling on to rebuild Israel to their uh, glory days, to their days where they were obedient to God. He's going to be uh, prophesied into a remnant, and he's going to give them encouragement because when they come out of that exile, things don't look that well. The Jerusalem is tore up, is um, flattened, nothing's growing there, burn up, disastrous, it's been 70 years, and things look terrible, and they're discouraged. And they are wondering, is God going to keep his promise? God, what are you going to do? And so this, these chapters from uh, 56 to 66 are to speak to that group there, but it's also to speak to future generations of what God will do for his people. And what he's calling us to do is that he has special promises for those who are obedient, those who are faithful, those who are committed to him, that remnant of people that remain faithful to God no matter what. And what God had to do originally with that judgment, sending people into exile in Babylon, he had to purge the, the wicked out and purify his remnant so they would have a glorious future. Chapter uh, chapters 56 through uh, 66 talks about how God is going to do that, what it's going to look like. It tells us about God's character. So we have a lot to look for in this lesson. It's going to be exciting. Uh, let's get to it right now. So when we approach uh, chapter 61, just glance at 60 a little bit. In 60, uh, God is telling them that he is going to do a great work for his people. He's going to build a great city. He talks about how good it's going to be, what it's going to be like. He's going to talk about how the people are going to, uh, are going to lack nothing. Violence will not be there. He's talking about the city of God, the city of Jerusalem that he is preparing for them and how great it is. The sun shall be no more your, your light by day, nor the brightness shall be of the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting night. He's in chapter 60. He's describing a fantastic place and fantastic environment in which God's people, those who are faithful, uh, those who are committed, those who are followers of his covenant, those who are true believers, this is the place in which they will live in, a fantastic place beyond their imagination. And this will give them hope, especially in the contrast of the place that they're living now, that barren place, that place that was destroyed by the Babylonians, that place that they're going to have to slave and work real hard to rebuild. God's going to take that and flip the script and give them something that's unimaginable. So when we get to chapter 61, he talks about the person of the Messiah and how the Messiah is going to bless them. They have a place that's going to be fantastic. Now they have a Messiah that's coming their way that will provide additional blessing from them. It's this Messiah that they're talking about doesn't mention Jesus by name, but that's what he's talking about. The Spirit of the Lord shall be upon me. Jesus is speaking right here. That Messiah is speaking because the Lord has anointed me. He will bring good news to the poor. Poor means not only financially poor, but spiritually poor. People who are burdened with, with, with issues, things that are not going right, injustices. He's going to bring good news to the poor, and he's going to lift up the brokenhearted. In other words, when Jesus comes, he's going to be, a, it says here, a, a proclaimer of liberty to the captives. He's going to be a proclaimer of good news. He's going to uh, comfort all those who mourn. He's going to be an uplift to them. And he's going to uh, take them from a place spiritually that they're real low and bring them to a place spiritually where they're real high because he's going to be the Messiah that's going to bring salvation to them. He's going to bring uh, uh, hope and encouragement to them and tell them that their future is great because they are part of the redeemed. And when you're part of the redeemed, there are benefits that go with that. And he talks about, let me just say a little bit more what he talks about. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Right now in the past, people have come over and taken your land and you have worked for them. In this day when the Messiah comes, that role will be burst. Those who have oppressed you, they will tend your flocks and they should uh, crop, they should tend to your fields. 
uh, foreigners shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Those nations that have come against you, they will work your land instead of you working their land. He says, but you shall be called priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as ministers of our God. In other words, when they when Jesus comes, those people are oppressed you. They will know that you are serving the one true God. He said, and you shall eat the wealth of the nations and in their glory you shall boast. Right now, they're eating your wealth. They're taking everything from you, but that will be reversed too. You will eat of their works, their, their wealth, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. It's a great future for the people of Israel, for the people of Judah. It doesn't look like it is now, but there is because God's going to keep every promise. God is making a way. And that's the way it is now. We're going through difficult times right now. Some of the worst times we can even imagine. This, this shutdown, this shelter in place, loss of jobs. People can't feed their families, no money, uh, uh, can't go anywhere, can't do this, and losing loved ones. Uh, people are getting sick. It looks like it is bad. It looks like it can't get any worse. But guess what? God is saying it's going to be much better. Just remain faithful and obedient to me. Don't lose sight. Don't lose hope. I will keep my promises. I will take care of you. It may be tough going for a little while. But look toward the future because your future is glorious. And so the first eight verses, gee, the Messiah is talking about. And then when we get to verse eight, the God is talking himself. God is talking. For I, the Lord, love justice. He's going to describe to us who he is. It's not so much about what God is going to do for the people. But God wants them to know his character, who he is. And you base your hope, now necessarily what he's done for you in the past, but you base your hope on the person who is able, and that's God himself. For I am the Lord and love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. God loves justice. In other words, he wants things that happen that, that are righteous. He wants, uh, he doesn't want to see people taken advantage of. He doesn't want to see people maybe uh, oppressed. He doesn't like that. He doesn't like robbery and wrong. He doesn't like people who steal. He doesn't like things, people who rob from one another. He does not like that. And so he starts off by saying, this is the type of God that I am. Uh, he could be saying that, uh, Israel, I didn't like it when you took advantage of other people. And he could be saying, Israel, I don't like it when people took advantage of you. And so he doesn't like it any kind of way. But here, he's really talking about, a. remember, the audience is a remnant of, of Israel, people who are committed to God, people who are part of the covenant, people who have been faithful, people who have been obedient. He's talking to uh, a select group of people that have weathered the storm and that are remaining faithful to him. But they've been through things. They have been wronged. They have been been uh, people have robbed them. They have received injustice instead of justice. So what God is saying here, because I am a God of justice, and you look back and you see how these nations have treated you. You see how these nations are have oppressed you. You see how they have done what they've done to you. I don't like what they've done. I don't like the robbery that's taking place. I don't like the wrongdoings that are taking place. I am a God of justice. I'm going to change that. He says, look, hang in there. Be faithful. Be committed because I will faithfully mean that you can, I, I guarantee you I will do this. I will give those who have been faithful, those who are part of the covenant, that remnant who has stayed with me no matter what, their recompense. Recompense means I will give them their reward. So what God is saying today is as we go through what we go through, stay faithful, stay true to his word, stay committed to God. Don't lose faith. Don't lose sight because in the end, I have a reward for you. And when God gives us a reward, guess what? It's beyond our imagination. It's just what we need and more. 
It is fantastic. It is awesome. God gives the perfect reward. He's going to reward us out of his grace and mercy for us being steadfast to him. I will give them, I will faithfully give them, remember this, their recompense, their reward. Look, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Those who remain faithful, God's going to make an everlasting covenant, a covenant that will never end, a covenant that will always abound, a covenant that will be there. God will make the covenant. He will be the author of it. That means he has the ability to keep his promise with his people. Look at what his promises are. Their offspring shall be known among the nations. Those who are faithful, that remnant, the people of Israel, people of Judah, their offspring, right now, they're not known at all. Right now, where you are coming out of exile and there beyond, they don't, people don't even know who Israel is. They don't care who Israel is. You are in a, a minuscule, an iota. You are a fly on the wall. People don't even pay attention to you, but that will change because you are a child of God because God has made a covenant with you because God will faithfully keep his word. He will reward you. Their offspring shall be known among the nations, meaning that in future generations, Israel will be known. God will make this happen. The, the, look at what God is doing. He is making people known of Israel. They will be known around the world as children of God. They will be known because of the God they serve, not because of what they do, but because of the God that they serve and their descendants in the midst of the people. They're just, right now, you're mixed and jumbled all together. And what happens a lot sometimes, especially with the Babylonians, they like to assimilate people and they brought the Jews in and they made them assimilate into the Babylonian culture. If you remember Daniel and, 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 and his friends, they tried to assimilate them and make them become Babylonians and blend them in and take their identity from a work, whereas people wouldn't even have known who Israel was. But look, there are descendants in the midst of the people, in the midst of people on this earth, in the midst of the countries in which you live in, guess what? You shall be known not by only by nations, but by the people that are around you. In other words, your, your heritage, the Jewish people, the people of Israel will never go away. Just like other nations have come and gone. All the Hittites and the Ittites and all those in the Bible, you read all those people who come against Israel. They are no Edomites. They are no longer there. But guess what? God is preserving you. And your name will be known amongst the nations, amongst the people, and it will not vanish. Look what it says. All who see them shall acknowledge them, that they are an offspring of the Lord the Lord has blessed. That they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. They will see you for who you are. Not that you're doing anything, but look what God has done. This passage here is about God. God making things happen. It's about his character, keeping his covenant. He promised to make them known among nations. He's reversing their fortune. Their, their descendants were in the midst of the people, reversing that where they are now. And all who see them shall acknowledge them where they're right now. They are not acknowledged at all. They are pity. They are looked down upon. And But when the future comes, they will see them. They'll see them offspring as the, type, as the people that the Lord has blessed. That's amazing. That gives you hope. God will keep his promises. We have to remember that during the difficult situations we go through, God knows your needs. God uh, gives, uh, he will give us our daily bread. It may not be everything that we want, but it will be what we need. God will take care of us. The, his remnant, if you are a child of God, you will be taken care of. And then look here. The, the the person who's speaking now changed. Now is Zion. It's that it's that the 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 remnant of believers during this time. It's um, Israel. It's the remnant of future believers at this time. He says, "I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God." So he's saying uh, what what the Zion is saying right here. What Israel is saying right here. I will rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt God. God will, I will love God so much that it will just come out of me. I, I, I can't help but rejoice him. And, and 
The question is why? Why is why is Zion, why is Israel saying this? Look, it gives us the answer here. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. I mean, God has saved me, not only physically, but spiritually. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. Uh, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Look what God gives us, his remnant, those he saves us. He saves us physically because uh, what's the point of being saved spiritually if we're not saved physically? He saves us spiritually. What's the point of being saved spiritually if we're not saved physically? In other words, he brings our physical needs and our spiritual needs and saves us. And that's what he says right here. Clothe, clothe me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, meaning that he has made me whole again. He has brought me back into harmony with God. He, had, he has put me in right standing. This is something God has done. This is not something we have done. We are boasting. I rejoice, he says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. I'm rejoicing in the Lord because look for what he has done. Look for what he will do. My soul will exalt in my God. Not that I'm doing anything, but I'm exalting God because look at what God is doing. Look at his character. Look at who he is. Not so much what he's done, but look at who how great he is. For he has clothed me in the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And look to what extent he has done this as he rescues us, as he makes us righteous, as he's brought us whole again. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest, with a beautiful headdress. That bridegroom, that groom is looking awesome on that wedding day. He is looking sharp. He has a headdress on that is fit for a priest. He can't get any better. As a bride adorns herself with her jewels, a bride on that wedding day looks great. They are wearing the finest of garments, the finest of jewelry. In other words, God's going to equip us and save us so much, make us righteous. We don't need anything else. He's going to give it to us to the nth degree. We are going to look good. We are going to be made righteous to the fullest extent where it can't even be done any, any, anymore. Then it says here, for as the earth, look what he says, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, as the garden causes what is the sown in it to sprout up. The earth can't help but bring forth sprouts. You put a seed, you water it, something's going to come out. A, and as a garden causes what is sown, a garden, you plant, you go to a garden, you plant something, sooner or later, it's going to come out. It's guaranteed. And because that's guaranteed, he uses an analogy, so as the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. If God can cause the earth to bring forth spouts, if he can cause a garden who has seeds sowed into it to bring um, up sprouts, how much more can the Lord God that we serve cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations? In other words, all the nations are going to see all of what God is doing for my remnant people. And when they see it, they're going to want part of it too. They're going to look up and they're going to have to give God some praise. They're going to have to say that nothing but God. That is, they are serving the one true God. That God's going to do it in such a way, it's going to draw, draw in people to want what Israel has. And Israel is going to do all what God has always called it to be, is be that light in the shining world. And so God's going to cause Israel to be uh, uh, righteous and praise is brought up from all the nations. The nations are going to be looking on and they're going to be looking at what God has done to these people. They're going to praise God's name and they're going to want what Israel has. They're going to want to serve the God of Israel, of that remnant people. That's what's going to happen. And then we go to uh, chapter 62 and then we see uh Zion's coming salvation. And this is what uh, many people think that this is uh, God speaking. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. And what the idea was in the past, they have, in this situation, they believe that God has been too silent and God has been quiet. He hasn't been around. But God is saying, I will not uh, 
keep silent. I will not be quiet until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. God's going to keep working and delivering Israel until they shine bright as a burning torch. It says here in two, the nation shall see your righteousness and all the kings of your glory, and you shall be called by a new name. God's going to give them a new name. And the mouth of the Lord will give, uh, that the mouth of the Lord will give. A new name means something special. A name identifies who you are. It's prophetic. Right now, Israel is down in the dumps. The people are down. God is saying, I'm going to give you a new name, a new life, a new identification. Uh, I'm going to give you a new name. And it says here, uh, you shall be crowned a beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your guard. And it says here, and you shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall be no more termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Look what he's saying. Here. All he's saying is this, I'm going to change your fortune, and it's a sign of me changing your fortune. I'm going to give you a new name. Don't worry about what you're call, being called right now. Don't worry about what you're thinking about yourself right now. That's going to change. Right now, you're being called forsaken, desolate. Uh, your lands be called desolate. Uh, you are despised or you're frowned upon, but that's going to change. Uh, when you, when Christ, when, it, toward the, when Christ comes toward the end of the time, your fortunes are going to change. You will not be called desolate anymore. You will not be called forsaken anymore. You shall be called my delight is in her. What better name? That's like my 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 servant, my faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's like being called that. My delight is in Israel, in her, and your land married. I am prospering your land. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. What an awesome thing. God has not forgotten about us in this situation. You may think God is silent. You may think God is quiet. You may think God is not doing something in the background, but I can guarantee you God is working something out for his glory. I can guarantee you in this situation, in this generation and generations to come, we will see the character of God exposed. We will see that God is a lover of justice. We will see that God is a hater of robbery. You're going, we're going to see that God is a hater of wrongdoing, of oppressed. As we come out of this situation we are, as we look back, and future generations look back, we're going to see how great God is, and we're going, to be able, we're going to realize that God has a great future for you and me. He is not done with us. Uh, he has not forgotten about us. But the key is that future that we talk about, how great it is, is for those who love him those who are obedient to him, those who want the same thing as that God wants, justice, those who remain faithful to him, those who are part of his covenant, we have a, uh, a great future to look for, just like the people of Israel, believers do, the remnant of Israel in this passage do. So I want to encourage you through this difficult time, remain faithful, do what is right, or be obedient. Uh, continue to spread the gospel, spread the good news of Jesus Christ. What a fantastic time that we have to do this. People are scared. People are panicking. What a great time to show them the love of God, to tell them who God is, that God keeps his promise. God's a God of justice. God hears our cries and that God has a glorious future for them right now and in the future. Well, people, I, I enjoyed this lesson. I hope that it's been helpful to you. Remember to hit the like button, hit the share button, hit the subscribe button. Stay faithful through this time. If God has blessed you to not be affected financially by what's going on, help somebody who is being affected. Help somebody who's lost their job. Help someone who has taken a, a pay cut. Help someone who has lost a loved one. Help someone who is ill and can't pay their bill. This is a time for his remnant to show the world the light of God, 
and God is counting on me and you. You are saved and rescued out of this situation for a reason. Be that remnant people. Show that, show the world that God's a God of justice, that his people will help people who have been wrong or people who have fallen on hard times. I love you people. I'll see you next week. And may God bless you. Amen.